Welcome to Israel in Depth, where scholars, policymakers, and leading experts come to discuss topics about Israel in depth. You're listening to a podcast by the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the host of this podcast. Joining me for this episode of Israel in Depth is Professor Avraham Sella. He is the Ephraim and Shirley Diamond Professor of International Relations and a senior fellow at the Harry S. Truman Research Institute for the Advancement of Peace at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. This year, he is also the Aaron and Cecile Goldman Visiting Israeli Professor at Georgetown University. Professor Seller specializes on Middle East politics with an emphasis on inter-Arab and Arab-Israeli relations, contemporary Palestinian politics and society, and transnational foreign fighters in comparative perspective. In addition to many published articles, Professor Seller has also published numerous books, including The Decline of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, Middle East Politics and the Quest for Regional Order, published in 1998, the Continuing Political Encyclopedia of the Middle East, published in 2002, and co-authored with uh, Sean Massal, The Palestinian Hamas, Vision, Violence and Adjustment, which was first published in 2000. The second edition came out in 2006, and I strongly encourage any readers, any listeners, uh, to go out and get a copy. Prior to his academic career, he served for 16 years as an analyst in the research division of the IDF's intelligence branch. In this capacity, he was involved in the Israeli-Egyptian peace talks and was later a member of the Israeli delegation to the military talks with Lebanon. So first of all, I want to thank you, Professor Salah, for joining me today. I know I'm sure you've been extremely busy over the last month, so I'm very grateful uh, for you to join us and to spend some time uh, with me uh, talking Hamas. Uh, in particular, I would like uh, us to really uh, discuss Hamas as an organization, as a kind of multifaceted organization, its history, its evolution, and its future uh, going forward. So to begin with, um, in your book that you co-authored with uh, Sean Michal, um, that came out, as I said, first of all in 2000, and then second edition in 2006, um, you um, presented Hamas in that book as primarily a social and a political organization. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that on, and in the way in which you understand Hamas before uh, October the 7th? Okay, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this uh, uh, podcast. Um, to answer this question, we have to remember when was the uh, book uh, published. Um, and yes, we um, tried to explore the origins of Hamas, which started... Um, or originated from the Muslim Brotherhood movement, uh, who, which was active for many years in, in Gaza Strip. And uh, Hamas actually was the extension of, of this uh, movement uh, once the Intifada erupted in late 1987. Um, and as of that um, change of moving to more political and uh, increasingly more more military uh, organization. Uh, and we actually tried to um, analyze the behavior of Hamas. And our main conclusion was that uh, uh, both um, ac activities or both uh, uh, um, spheres of ac activities, the social, uh, uh, religious, and political, and the one that we describe as militant or military, uh, were, were quite subjected to um, cost and benefit calculations. And, and this was the primary uh, conclusion of the book, that actually we, 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 we were dealing with a pragmatic uh, movement. And we included in the analysis both uh, local, namely the inside uh, leadership as well as the outside leadership, those who, um, as a result of the Israeli uh, um, repression and 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 chasing the uh, leadership of of the of the movement, uh, uh, found refuge in uh, neighboring Arab countries and uh, kept uh, managing or kept uh, financing, uh, basically the the movement inside Gaza. Um, but one thing that I, I uh, have myself been uh, um, bothered with and, and, and 
I'm not sure I, I have the, the uh, full answer to is uh, whether we are dealing with the same leadership now, because a lot has changed since then. And especially since 2011, 12, when actually the leadership inside Gaza uh, uh, shifted more towards people who were uh, spending more than two decades in Israeli jails. Uh, and, 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 and first and foremost, uh, 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 Yahya Sinwar, uh, who uh, later, shortly after uh, being released from the Israeli prison, uh, was elected as the head of Hamas in, in Gaza Strip. Um, to what extent this change of uh, uh, leadership can explain uh, the, the differences, both in uh, statements and, and, and political discourse, as well as uh, the uh, modus operandi of, uh, of of Hamas. That's not very very clear, and and we still have to uh, uh, really uh, uh, look for some some uh, uh, documents and 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 more inside uh, uh, information to be able to uh, uh, identify th that that change if there has been indeed any change. One thing I want to explain. One thing I, I need to to emphasize. Already during the time when we worked on that book, me and, 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 and Professor Shaul Mish'al, we had the clear picture that we are not talking about one Hamas. Uh, first of all, within, within the Gaza Strip, the uh, military branch uh, was pretty much free and, and independent. Uh, and, and they created very close relationship with the leadership out of Gaza. So. In, in addition to the inside and outside leadership, we also have the uh, military apparatus uh, uh, operating in Gaza, uh, whose decisions and uh, uh, priorities were not always uh, discussed uh, either with the local leadership, inside leadership, or with the outside leadership. And in that sense, we, we should remember again, that the, the main uh, um, rank and file of, of those people who, who, who who composed or who, who uh, made the the military uh, uh, power of, of Hamas and which increased a long a long time, came from the margins of society, from the margins of the of the uh, uh, refugee uh, uh, um, uh, society in Gaza. Uh, many of them were not very uh, educated. Uh, many of them came from uh, um, um, very poor poor families. And uh, and in in a way, I I can't say it in 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 very strong words, but I, it's it's my 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 gut feeling that there was some tension all along between this group of people who came from below and those who uh, were uh, 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 leading the 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 the, the, the movement, and um, and I can tell you, for example, that in two thousand and seven, when uh, uh, Hamas stage this uh, uh, takeover or, or coup against the Palestinian Authority, it was absolutely uh, against the view of the uh, outside leadership of, uh, of Mash'al and others. I know for sure that Mash'al even spoke on the phone with Ahmed Jabari, the uh, uh, commander of the Palestinian forces, and ordered him to stop what they were doing, and 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 Ahmed Jabari hang on uh, his phone and 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 refused to speak with him at all. So 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 we have to we have to take these things into into consideration when we try to explain what happened, who decided what. Obviously, what happened on the seventh of October was something that was was prepared a long time. Uh, it's, it doesn't make any sense that the inside leadership did not know about these uh, these uh, preparations, uh, uh, and and I am I'm I'm uh, almost sure that the instructions given to the forces that eventually penetrated into into Israel and uh, conducted all these uh, atrocities, committed all these atrocities, uh, were quite well known to to the leadership. I I I, I don't think that this could be uh, 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 so separate at that level um, because we, 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 we know that they were given uh, uh, printed uh, uh, instructions 
found on the on the bodies of uh, of those who were uh, uh, killed by the Israelis or uh, uh, taken captives, and and so there's another question: uh, Why did they uh, uh, choose to um, uh, 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 do what they did, namely uh, uh, killing and 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 uh, um, and 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 and, and doing all these atrocities, I don't have words to, to explain, but di dissecting bodies, uh, burning bodies, uh, uh, raping, uh, uh, um, beheading, and, and, and all kinds of things, in addition to uh, uh, the fact that uh, they were citizens or civ civilians, we're talking about whole families, children, women, men, and then the uh, uh, um, taking captives, how many captives you need, Israel in, in 2011 uh, released 1,100 Palestinian uh, uh, prisoners for one Israeli soldier. So they didn't need that number, and especially not women and, and, and sometimes infants that they, that, and elderly people. So, so something is still to be explained why they chose, chose to, uh, um, why they chose to, uh, uh, do it this way in that manner yes yeah Absolutely. and and, and yeah. by this actually forcing israel so even if they did not expect to have this success on that day even if it was only 50 percent of their uh, best expectations uh they shouldn't have understood that israel would not be able to uh, uh this time um you know be content only with some skirmishes and 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 exchange of fire but rather simply go into gaza and decimate uh, hamas once and for all yes so i want to come back to that question because I, I i i also have wrestled with you know trying to understand what hamas is uh, objectives and goals were because, like you, I think Hamas's violence has always been instrumental and strategic, and so we have to ask ourselves, you know, what what purpose does it serve, and what what um, goals did Hamas have in mind? I want to just go back a moment though, because I think what you've um, and picking up the points you've said about Hamas, you know, emphasizing that it's not a a kind of you know you're, we're both international relations scholars, so I'm going to use some of that language. It's not a unitary actor. Right, it's not a, a single. It's actually got different um, leaderships, uh, different wings. It's not a monolithic organization. And I think the other point that you've uh, you made in your book and you've uh, reiterated it uh, now is that it isn't a static organization. That it evolves and adapts. You know, and I think some of the discourse around about Hamas since October the seventh has kind of presented it as a singular you know, entity that is since its charter of 1987 until today essentially pursued this kind of genocidal goal uh, in a in a in a um, in an unrelenting manner, and that it's at best only made short kind of slight tactical shifts or occasionally, you know, essentially pretended that it was more moderate. Um, in terms of understanding the evolutions of Hamas, right? Do you see then this evolution? You know, you think you, the first one, I suppose, is the evolution from the Muslim Brotherhood to, to become Hamas, and then the evolution to adapt to adopt a military wing in 1991, and then to use terror. So, how do you how do you see these evolutions or shifts? So is it a question of the internal balance of power within the organization, as you were discussing, um, you know, as one leader is replaced by another leader, or is, or is it um, a response to these kind of external events, you know, opportunities, if you will, that that arise? How do you see this organization shifting over time and evolving and in response to what kinds of uh, factors? Well, in this context, um, even within the um, political leadership of, uh, of Hamas, uh, we know for sure that there were um, differences of opinion between people who were uh, uh, more moderate and others who were more militant. Um, a number of uh, uh, you know, core uh, uh, members or uh, uh, really uh, people who were members of the, of the, of the core uh, decision makers in Gaza in the 90s, for example, some of them 
uh, seceded from the movement, and 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 one or two of them uh, became even even uh, uh, senior members of of uh, of the Palestinian Authority, and 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 uh, uh, we know for sure that some some uh, uh, of the of the senior uh, uh, leaders of of Hamas did not agree with everything. And, and in terms of the evolution of the political or strategic uh, uh, thinking of, of Hamas, yes, the, the charter, for example, speaks very clearly about jihad and the uh, ultimate goal is to uh, have uh, uh, Palestine uh, as a whole uh, under, under the banner of Islam, right? Uh, and definitely liberation of Palestine means uh, the uh, 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 elimination of, of the state of Israel. But in the course of the 90s already, including by Ahmad Yassin, the spiritual father and the, and the founder actually of, of, of the Islamic uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood movement in, in Gaza, uh, he said it very clearly that if Israel would withdraw to the borders of 1967, including East Jerusalem, and agree to the return of the Palestinian refugees, then Hamas would be willing to accept Hudna, which means truce, indefinite truce, uh, basically coming very close to the position of the PLO. Other than the difference was, and they repeated it uh, uh, constantly, uh, uh, they would never sign an agreement with Israel, but they would accept Hudna. Uh, and, and in the course of the years, they even, I mean, for example, uh, uh, during the time of, of the um, uh, um, talks between uh, uh, Prime Minister Olmert and, and, and Mahmoud Abbas, uh, they made kind of, uh, they, they gave a carte blanche to, to uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas saying, uh, we are not against the negotiations. We will judge it in accordance with its results, its, its consequences. So, and this in 2017 was once again followed by publishing a uh, policy paper, which was described as a new uh, kind of charter, not exactly, but something <clears throat> that, that Hamas was interested in showing uh, a more pragmatic uh, and, and more willingness to accept a uh, political, political settlement. What happened between 2017 and, and, and <clears throat> I'm sorry, and 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 uh, a few weeks ago. That's that's a that's the question. That's or question. not weeks ago, but a year ago when they started preparing for this operation. Uh, obviously, obviously there are questions that we don't understand. One thought that I have, and this is this is a question that I I'm I'm more. Uh, in 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 a, in a you know I I I I I tend to put it forward rather than answer it because I don't know the answer. To what extent the connections between Hamas and Iran, especially in the last few years, have they changed anything in the perceptions in the uh, political goals? Because I remember about two years ago I saw. Uh, uh, Yahya Sinwar speaking to a small audience in Gaza and uh, telling them something about the day when we will be able to tell you how much Iran helped you help us in 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 uh, providing us with with weapons that it's not yet the time to talk about mm -hmm. something like this and yes Hamas established diplomatic or political relationship with Iran already in 1992. Um, and later on, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed Yassin himself visited and, and met with Khamenei, the uh, um, supreme jurist of, uh, of the, the Ayatollah regime. But uh, has, has anything happened in the last few years that changed it? Because we know that the volume of uh, uh, arms supplies to Gaza in the last few years has been not only expedited, but apparently we are talking about a new level of 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 uh, cooperation. And and again, this brings uh, up the question: Did the Iranian uh, government or or um, uh, the um, Revolutionary Guard uh, 
did, did they know? Did they have any any hand in in planning? In 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 in, in uh, I'm not I'm not I don't think that they instructed anyone, but at least in the picture of, about what the developing the kind of idea done. for a right. massive attack. Exactly. Yeah, no, I think that's a very plausible thesis, hypothesis, if you like. I mean, you know, when I look at, at Hamas, particularly between the period of, you know, 2011, 2012 to 2017, you may see during that period, you know, you mentioned the policy document that it, that it put forward. And, you know, in the years prior to that, Hamas leaders uh, like uh, Rantisi and even Mashal were indicate in speeches and interviews, you know, a more of a, indicating a more moderate position. Of course, during that period of time as well, Hamas's external sponsors changed. It fell out with uh, the Assad regime, obviously, over the Syrian civil war. It had a freeze in its relationship with Iran during that period. So I wonder, you know, I can't help but wonder, was there an opportunity missed? Was it possible during that period of time, particularly, um, to maybe, you know, have encouraged Hamas's further moderation and perhaps, you know, the shift since then in recent years, which is clearly, which has obviously happened as a, in, we can see on, on October, October the 7th, may, was it because Hamas reached the conclusion that they would never be able to essentially form a Palestinian government in its entirety? Um, you know, the efforts of reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah, uh, repeatedly were stymied and failed. I mean, do you think in some way I was also a, a consequence of those failed efforts to reconcile and the inability of Hamas to um, essentially promote its goals through the ballot box and and through uh, po politics, which it's what it, what it looked like to be doing, you know, it, it, in running in, in local elections and running in national elections, uh, do you see, do you think there was an opportunity that was missed or was it really, you know, um, as some would argue, actually it, Hamas was always a wolf in sheep, you know, maybe it tried on a sheep's clothing for a little bit, but it was always fundamentally uh, guided by this kind of essentially jihadist ideology. Well, let me, let me start from um, some... Uh, really amazing interviews given recently by a number of uh, Hamas leadership abroad. Uh, and I'm talking about Mash'al, I'm talking about Salah al-Aruri, I'm talking about others. Anyway, it will come in a second. Um, and, and for example, Ghazi Hamad explains that uh, uh, this is something that uh, it's it's like 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 an instinct. He says we did it once, we will do it again, we will do it second, three, four times, because because Israel has no no room in 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 our region or something like that. Uh, and and then Osama Hamdan uh, a few day, days ago has given a uh, an interview to an NRK uh, um, uh, television, <clears throat> uh, and 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 and. This Osama Hamdan himself, I have endless of quotations from the 1990s and early 2000s in which he definitely spoke about possible hudna and so on. And now he speaks about no way, not, not even a possibility. The, the, interviewer, the interviewer asks him, so with what kind of Israel, on what territory you will be willing to accept it? And he says, there's, there's no way of accepting Israel. So, so something something has changed, and I I'm, I'm 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 wondering what what really what really what really happened in that in that context, um, and uh, and uh, 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 that same Mashal who is now speaking uh, about uh, again the uh, uh, maximalist uh, um, um, expectations of, of Hamas to establish a, a, a Muslim state, that Mash'al himself during the period before the elections of 2006 spoke in a language that was entirely, entirely uh, uh, bereft of uh, Quran, Jihad, uh, Allah, Muhammad, and, and and so on and so forth, and spoke in a language of reforms and and so on. Okay, so we can understand that, tactically speaking, Hamas made an effort to uh, 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 
become become uh, uh, publicly accepted, and 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 that's why they they managed to uh, win a sweeping uh, uh, victory over over Fatah, and and have a majority in the legislative council. But it went on for a while until they found out that Fatah did not want them as partners in in a in a joint uh, government. And as you said, in the in the following years, there were many many attempts that uh, uh, even Arab countries uh, 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 championed, uh, including Saudi Arabia. And only when those uh, failed, uh, Hamas eventually took over Gaza and 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 pushed uh, uh, the 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 Fatah people out. Uh, so so so, the most significant and the most interesting uh, uh, interview recently that I that I heard was of uh, another member of the, the, the Hamas uh, uh, leadership who actually said that uh, the, 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 the purpose of this operation was to tell the whole world that this uh, uh, stalemate cannot go on. And especially when Saudi Arabia and, uh, um, and Israel were conducting uh, uh, sort of negotiations or diplomatic uh, uh, talks about establishing uh, uh, diplomatic relations and, and recognition of the state of Israel. So I'm, I'm trying to think about it. It's like when Sadat wanted to create, to break the, the stalemate in 1973, but he was willing to go for something that would be some kind of give and take. Hamas, if they indeed wanted to break the stalemate and, and start or have a new start, then they did the wrong thing. They 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 threw the, the the baby together with the water, as we say. Absolutely, yeah. It does it does seem to defy rational in terms of you know. I mean, and then to repeat the desire to. I mean, it seems to be very counterproductive because they've basically said they want to carry out multiple more October seventh. So, you know, it's a completely understandable why the vast majority of Israelis believe. Well, there's nothing, you know, we cannot coexist with this organization or even contain it. So I wanted to ask you about that, you know, given this shift, for whatever the reason, whether it's Iran's, and I think that's quite a good explanation, Iran's growing influence, maybe the the uh, kind of diffusion of jihadist, um, you know, st influence style kind of ISIS um, on the organization, for whatever the reason, clearly Hamas post October the 7th is an organization, at least in this moment, dominated by its military, the most hardcore hardline elements. They seem to be calling the shots, Yahya Sinwa uh, in particular, you know, from wherever he is under, uh, in a bunker under Gaza. Um, does that mean then, you know, when we think about the future, that, the, that Israel is essentially right to insist that there is no way that Hamas can continue to exist. It must be completely militarily defeated and destroyed. What does this mean for how Israel and the international community should deal with Hamas today and going forward? Well, obviously, um, Israel is seeking to eliminate Hamas as a, a military uh, organization as a uh, system of institutions. Um, in other words, to break the the, the, the backbone of, of Hamas as, as an organization, uh, be it the military part or the, the administrative part. Um, obviously, again, Israel cannot uh, uh, eliminate the idea of, uh, of Islamism, uh, definitely not from a society that is so uh, impoverished so uh, desolate uh, as the one in Gaza and which the Israeli operation, which hasn't uh, um, uh, um, ended yet, uh, would impoverish them even more as, as the, the, this op land operation continues. So, so you ask yourself, what, what is going to happen to this population? Uh, and, and, and regardless of the question, what kind of leadership uh, uh, would would be uh, uh, emerging from from below? Is it going to be another version of Hamas? Is it going to be even more radicalized uh, leadership? But before all this, we have to ask the question: 
what is going to happen with the, these 2.2 million people uh, after Israel finishes the uh, land operation. Because what we see already is that Israel is leaving behind a flattened area. Namely, there will be no homes, no institutions, no services. What this population is going to do, where are they going? They have the sea on the one side, they have the, the Egyptian uh, uh, territory where Egypt says no, not one uh, uh, refuge, refugee is, is crossing here. And, and so before any, any question about the political uh, 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 future of, of the Gaza Strip, I ask myself, what is going to happen with, with the people, with the population? Uh, and, and, and I'm not saying that they are all uh, righteous uh, uh, citizens without any blame or without any responsibility for uh, Hamas's activities or Hamas's operation. But regardless of that, in order to uh, uh, start even thinking about any future uh, 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 centralized organization or any kind of, 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 of government, you, you have to connect to it the question, how are we going to rebuild Gaza Strip? Today, this morning, I heard an Israeli uh, uh, former general who said it's none of Israel's interest to rebuild Gaza. But I'm asking if, if it's not our interest, then what are we going to do with these with these people? Because all these ideas that some Israeli politicians are now throwing in the air uh, about uh, simply sending the Palestinians to whoever is willing to accept them is so far from reality and 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 it's really hallucinated. Uh, it has no no uh, basis, uh, definitely not from the, the international viewpoint. And, and above and, and, and beyond all this, I am most uh, worried and, and really, really concerned about Israel's legitimacy uh, abroad, Israel's legitimacy in the international, at the international community, because Israel's uh, uh, situation in that context is already from the beginning, from, 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 from birth, it is problematic. We know that. There's no state in the world which, uh, um, or who's, who's, right to exist is even uh, uh, asked or, or about or doubted. And, and Israel's uh, uh, right of, of, of existence, every time there is a, a major problem of that kind, for example, during the Second Intifada, when, when, the, when Israel conducted the uh, 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 defense shield uh, uh, operation, um, the, the the European left and the, the Islamists uh, brought up the, the, that question, and and you wonder uh, again what is the connection between this and historical anti-Semitism, hatred to Jews before that, and and all this is now coming uh, along and 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 seem to uh, uh, increase as the Israeli operation in Gaza. Uh, uh, continues, regardless of what the United States is, is saying or some Western uh, democracies uh, uh, are now, uh, 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 um, uh, how they 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 uh, perceive the Israeli or how they state uh, their policies, because because it's now the 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 crowds of 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 people, the the uh, public opinion in these countries uh, uh, definitely is going to. Um, uh, limit the abilities of these governments to keep supporting the state of Israel. Absolutely. So actually, um, I have a kind of a final question for you on that. And it, it's 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 maybe a difficult one to answer, but uh, something I've been thinking about, um, you know, you've talked about the how Hamas has shifted and evolved over time and how it's increasingly come to now adopt kind of a hardline maximalist position. Do you think Hamas's adoption of this position is in any way encouraged by the criticism or the attacks on Israel's legitimacy around the world? In other words, is it is it could it be that Hamas's leadership are seeing the trends in public opinion and are seeing the 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 in, uh, growing demands for Israel to cease to be a Jewish state? Or do that has has that if they look at kind of 
progressive opinion in Europe and increasingly in the United States as well, which I'm sure they do. Um, they look at, you know, they study Israel and I'm sure they also look at, you know, does, in other words, does some of that um, delegitimization on opposition to Israel around the world, do you think that may feed into Hamas's um, kind of obstinacy, hardline position and maximalism going forward, that they basically feel like, well, once we thought we needed to accept a two-state solution, because that's what the world was promoting. But now the world seems to be moving away from that. Now we can actually, you know, stick to our guns, literally. And uh, and because we believe that actually Israel's days are, are numbered. Hamas is absolutely attentive and uh, even sensitive to uh, public opinion, uh, uh, not only in the Arab and Muslim world, that's for sure, but also uh, in the West and, and international point of view or uh, uh, public opinion in general. Um, whether or not they uh, uh, take it as, a, as an encouragement, uh, it might well be uh, because as of that, that sensitivity and that willingness to, uh, uh, um, or not willingness, but eagerness to actually uh, cater to the expectations of the international public opinion by, for example, uh, presenting themselves in the media uh, as uh, as the victims, as those who actually um, um, are not to be blamed for what happened because it's not Hamas. It's uh, simply some crowd who entered from Gaza and, and did a few things. And even if some soldiers were killed, or even some, some if some some civilians uh, in Israel were killed, in any case, they one day they they would become become soldiers. And actually, uh, but I, but you know. What what I wanted to what I wanted to 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 say is something a little bit a little bit different. I uh, two weeks ago I published in one of the Israeli uh, websites uh, an article where I uh, uh, warned that uh, by by the land operation that Israel was going to uh, to to start, uh, Israel might uh, 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 fulfill the uh, uh, best of, of expectations of, uh, of Hamas, and not only Hamas, but other enemies of Israel, because, because this would, uh, would you know, lead to Israel's delegitimization in the, in the in international uh, uh, arena, and, and, and something that Israel cannot, cannot afford, cannot, uh, uh, I mean, I teach, among other things, uh, Israel foreign policy, then Israel's foreign policy was all the years uh, 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 meant to first and foremost uh, uh, ensure that Israel would have the necessary means to protect itself, to, to defend itself, namely uh, uh, military uh, 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 support and, and in addition to, of course, diplomatic. But this was the main the main thing. And 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 then the question is where Israel is gonna gonna be. In, in what kind of situation and position uh, when all this is 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 done uh, israel may may win the war um, or may may win the battle but lose uh, the, the the war over the most significant thing which is israel's legitimacy and i think that israel's legitimacy is the problem not necessarily israel's military power it's a fact that israel uh, 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 succeeded in uh, um, promoting a uh, close relationship with a number of Arab countries, sign two peace agreements with its uh, immediate neighbors and, and Abraham Accords and so on. But the problem is the, the legitimacy and this legitimacy is connected to the Palestinian issue. And, and so if this war is, is not going to, you know, wake up the Israeli uh, political echelon to the need to uh, give more attention and and really understand the connection between these two uh, 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 cause and, and 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 effect, then 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 this war uh, was 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 uh, you know uh, really really of no point. Yes, I think you're right. I think in many ways that is you've identified the real existential threat to Israel, and it's not uh, you know members of Hamas's military wing. 
Uh, but as you said, the legitimacy of the state and, and in fighting against Hamas's military wing, it can end up undermining its legitimacy and, and endangering its uh, this existential threat. Um, Professor Seller, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. It's been a really uh, enlightening conversation. I could have continued it for many more hours, uh, but I don't want to uh, keep our listeners any longer. So I want to thank you. Uh, really, and I want to encourage uh, all the listeners um, to uh, to to follow Abraham Seller's writing, his research. Um, this is somebody who spent a very long time studying Hamas, and I think is one of the really the leading experts on the organisation. So thank you uh, for coming on uh, Israel in depth, um, and I want to thank all of our uh, listeners wherever you are. Uh, you've been listening to an episode of Israel in depth. Thank you for listening, and be on the lookout for more episodes to come. Thank you for having me. Thank you.